So Brittany Slyback is uh, a professor of biology at Trinity University in Texas um, and is currently doing a uh, second century stewardship fellowship um, at Acadia, looking at small mammal biodiversity and um, influences and um, relationships to where people are and um, how habitats and landscapes change and how those um, interact. And so Brittany has been in the rain, in the sun, in some wind a little bit, I think, and in the fog. That's Scudic for the last little while here. And is fresh out of the field right now. <laughs> so, um, so thank you, Brittany, for joining us. And um, yeah. Take it away. You want me to keep going? No, I, I think can that's keep going. If you want. Um, and I appreciate the invitation. I'll see if I can like somehow. Okay. Just it's always happens. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just able to leave. <laughs> to do that. Um, and I, I'm going to sit here because I've been told that that way they, there's a visual because this owl isn't working. So usually I'm one to like move around. So I apologize ahead of time if I jump up um, and start doing other things. So yes, thank you for the invitation. Thank you guys for spending your lunch with me. Um, I'm really excited. As Vic said, we just finished a big trapping event. And so I have some unpolished data to show you. And the title's a bit misleading because to be fully honest, when um, Emma had emailed me about this, I did not expect to have the data that we have. And I was like, oh, we're going to talk about this other part of the project. So we'll focus on that. And this will be this really cool recreation piece. Um, and then, well, part of the reason why I love doing what I do is because something always surprises me. And we have lots of data that is a different story that we've kind of been working through. Um, so I'll talk about this a little bit. But uh, for the most part, I'm going to talk more small mammal stuff. OK. But to start with, I wanted to kind of get everybody on the same page. Let's see if I can remember how to use Zoom and computer. Ah, there we go. And get us thinking about this relationship between mammalian biodiversity, recreational use, and land management. Um, and I don't think I need to convince anyone in this room or on the Zoomverse that having people experience our natural landscapes is one of the best ways to really foster appreciation for them, right? Getting out, having that personal connection, um, really helps to promote conservation and love for those landscapes. Right? As a teacher, I take this to heart, and these are some of my students on the left, and that's actually my mother on the right. Mm -hmm. uh, she's, in my view, a very great conservation story, like not a very outdoorsy person who over time has turned into one. <laughs> um, so I really take this to heart, and this is something that, you know, a concept makes more sense if you go outside and you can see it, right? If you want to understand amphibian diversity, if we want to talk vertebrate ecology, let's go look at a landscape, let's get our hands on some vertebrates, let's talk about these things, because it's that personal connection. As you all know, as land managers, though, us being on the landscape results in alteration of habitats, right? So you guys are dealing with lots of social trails, you're dealing with lots of people in parking. I will say being back on MDI is a bit of a shock <laughs> being lost for so long. Um, it's fun though. Um, and so us being on that landscape though alters behavior and occupancy and presence absence uh, or presence of organisms, right? So we know from literature that a lot of organisms actually just become more nocturnal. Okay, they avoid areas of people, so that can result in reproductive changes, it can result in community changes. And so how do you really balance these two is what I'm really interested in. Um, and so as a vertebrate ecologist, one of the things that we've been looking at is, is exactly this, right, this recreational use component, but then also the effect of management disturbance in the form of a single species management strategy on community. So come on in. Can we? Okay. Wyoming spuds. <laughs> we'll get to the names later. We have trans names. Uh, mad dogs. On there. <laughs> so, um, just talking about kind of giving an overview of um, the topic here. So, one one of the things I'm really interested in is again where the mammals are and where the people are. 
right? And how we can actually use this information to influence management decisions. So more evidence-based natural resource and conservation management decisions. Um, this is an example of the partner study site to what I'm doing here in Acadia. So this is in Texas. So I live in San Antonio, which is the big old state of Texas, kind of in the center, if there's a center. Um, and this piece of property, I'm gonna use my, my pointer here on the computer. Uh, this is Government Canyon State Natural Area. So this is a 25,000 acre state natural area. So different management opportunities than like a national park, right? They're only open four days a week. They close the back country for bird breeding habitat. When it rains a lot, the trails shut down. <clears throat> they don't like muddy trails. Okay, so it is there to protect the Edwards Aquifer. They're focused on that natural resource management first and foremost. Um, and it actually upsets a lot of the public. So one of the things that we're interested in is, okay, these high use trails, where are, what trails people are using, but then also where are the working zones? So we did a study, um, a pilot this past spring, and what we found are things like our javelinas, which I don't have here, but our javelinas, our, um, our canids and um, our personidae, so our raccoons and things, really love to be around areas where people are. Makes sense. Things like cervids, really far away from trails, whether that's because it's the people or if it's because their predators are on the trails, we don't know, right? Interesting. What was more interesting is there were clear activity pattern differences. So in areas where it's close to the public, coyotes were out all day. Areas that was open to the public, you only saw them in the peak of the night. Okay. So again, this is this example of this variation um, and our effects. From a single species management perspective, that kind of northeast corner that set um, confirmed habitat, that's actually bird breeding habitat. So we're going to be managing it to maintain the breeding habitat. And the question there is a smaller landscape scale. Okay, we've got a focus of a bird, but we know it's going to change the ecological community. So how is that going to happen? Okay, so these are kind of the two levels that I'm interested in. That's also a breeding pair of coyotes we got on camera. The one on the right is pregnant, and she's awesome. They're my favorite. It's the worst care to get to in the world. Um, okay. So when we're thinking about how we manage landscapes, right, we've got to know what's there. And part of that is the people. And so this is some data that I pulled from the visitor reports. This is just of student because when you plot MDI on this, you blow stuff of the water. Okay. So I'm going to be a little bit scudic focused for a while. So um, on the left, right, it's reported recreation visits on um, your y-axis and just by year on the x. And so I did five-year increments until um, 2019 because we all know that there was a dip in 2020 because of COVID, right? But then there's also been a bit of a push of you know, people rediscovering outside. Let's get outside and connect with these spaces. So you're seeing an increase in visitation, both MDI and student, okay? Lots of people are here. <laughs> You're managing this in many ways, like Sunrise on Cadillac, right? I remember living here and we didn't have to have reservations. We went up all the time. Um, and so when I visited, I was about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe, so many people up there. So of course, these management aspects, these management decisions, you're making these different logistical decisions that'll help protect these natural resources. So vehicle re reservations, these trail closures, right? The falcon recovery, so if they're in falcon, these all assist in protecting these natural resources. But the again, the other piece of this is active management is itself a form of disturbance, okay? So changing the hydrology in Great Meadow is really important. That is an active management component though that could influence, I would expect it to influence the ecology of the landscape moving forward. The soil hero that just happened, so, you know, restoring these summits is really important, but I guarantee you from a long-term perspective, they're going to have some sort of effect on the ecological community, okay? Um, and so understanding what that effect is, is really important to make management decisions in the long-term. So here are the objectives of the project. The first is to investigate the effects of landscape ecology. So this is mainly in terms of on scudic and acquisition, so the newer acquisition versus the old boundary, but just in general, the history of the landscape, how that can influence um, mammalian biodiversity and community assemblages, um, but then also disturbance on mammalian biodiversity. So we're talking recreational use, but we're also talking these management decisions, okay? But also a big part of this is just to provide some information on sites that have not been previously sampled in Acadia. At least to my knowledge, it's not, right? I'm sure there's unpublished things out there. Um, but so the areas that we're interested in include MDI. Um, so summits on MDI in particular is a huge interest. 
um, Great Meadow, right? And then Scudic Peninsula. And part of this too is a really nice story where you have a peninsula and you have an island. So there's a connectivity question here, okay? Um, so the rest of this is really gonna focus on the Scudic component because that's what our focus is this year. Next year's um, gonna be NDI. Well, maybe some this year too. I need to talk to Mr. Wheeler about that. <laughs> so here's phase one. Phase zero was actually a first run at Great Meadow. Um, so I'm happy. And please guys, at any point, I should have said this, please interrupt if you have questions or comments or, you know, like I don't like hearing myself talk for long periods of time. Um, but we did take a run at Great Meadow. And so that is part of this, Part of what I love about this project, maybe Vic doesn't, is that we should sort of like get data. I call Vic, I'm like, so here's what's going on. Um, what should we do? And so, you know, as someone really interested in making sure, you know, I have a lot of questions, but I want to make sure his questions as a manager are also answered. And I think there's multiple ways that we can do that. So things are changing. Um, so we'll revisit Great Meadow at some point. But the big phase one is the camera study. Right. So the goal of this is what is the biodiversity on Scudic Peninsula um, and how does recreational influence, recreational use influence the presence and occupancy? So again, where are the mammals? Where are the people? Right. And here I'm really talking mammals over 250 grams. You can't get red squirrels on camera. We have them on camera. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, this is biased towards larger mammals. Okay. So what we've done you got Scudic Peninsula on your right. Uh, we made a grid of the entire peninsula. So we actually have 27 cameras deployed about 700 meters apart. That was decided because it gives us a good coverage of the entire entirety of the peninsula, um, which also maintains a decent distance for occupancy models. Um, five of these cameras serve as both grid and trail cameras, right? We know wildlife also uses trails. So cameras were not moved more, uh, more than 50 meters from that randomized point. Um, but five of them were well within that 50 meter range. So we decided to also put them on the trail. So the grid camera specific are in gray. Um, the grid and trail are the white boxes. And then we deployed an additional nine cameras either on trails or corridors because we're curious. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. So I have a question about yep. um, selection of uh, sites. Yep. Uh, a couple of sites that are pretty popular uh, with visitors uh, and not including Scooty Point here are Little Moose Island mm -hmm. and also Raven's Fest, which yep. I'm sure you're aware of. Did you consider whether to put families in those areas to specifically find out whether there were impacts going on uh, at that end? That's an excellent question, and yes. So Little Moose um, is closer than that 700 meters. And to be honest, we keep talking about getting over to Little Moose, but the tide hasn't worked out with our trapping schedule, but we plan to deploy one and have one out there at least um, two months to look. Um, Raven says I haven't, it got to the point where there was a, how much data, it's not too much data, but what should we focus on now? And then we yeah. can target other later. So we're trying, we tried to do it in a way that we get a good coverage of the entirety of the peninsula and the hotspot areas. So then we could tailor questions and if we needed to bait for certain carnivores or if we needed to resample something we could. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the camera little moose it just tight hasn't actually worked with our 2 a.m. small mammal <laughs> range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but that's on the list. So these guys, um, as you can see, the, the areas of interest, the power line, um, we've got some on the bike paths, several on different trails. We went ahead and put one actually on big moose that to that power line corridor too. All of the cameras on the grid are the same brand, okay? Um, most of the cameras are actually the same brand, but the kind of additional cameras, and this is the researcher me saying this, they all have to be less than a second trigger speed. So it's, they're actually all less than 0.6 seconds. The ones on the grid are 0.3. Um, we did a three burst photo and it's one minute interval. So we are being kind of conservative here. Uh, the average height of the cameras was about 55 centimeters. Part of this is because there's a couple points that the huckleberry, is like up to here. I'm six feet, so it's huge. Um, and so you, you know, we were trying to work with that. They are facing trails or open quarters whenever possible. We were not looking for trails next to our camera sites. We are not trying to bias this, right? We wanted this as randomized as possible. We also didn't want to cut down a bunch of vegetation because that's ground disturbance. Okay, so again, we're even balancing that um, ability to do research. Um, these we're going to do a full camera download um, in. August, we've been checking them. We're gonna do the full download in August, but uh, they're gonna be deployed till December. 
because we're interested in seasonal variation. We would expect to see differences. So, so this was originally what I was going to focus on for the talk. So I was like, we'll go get all that data. And then we had a lot of small mammals. So I wanted to show you, though, just some fun field pictures. I want to say with this, um, because people can get like they're on trails, we do have information out. So on the right hand side is um, a picture of one of our signs and we have a science in progress sign out. We want people to know what's going on. It can be kind of creepy to be in your national park and just have um, a camera out. I will say I was really nervous about that. My name is on all of those tags. <laughs> and I've had, now you can test this. We had people come up and be like, are you Brittany? I'm like, no, <laughs> yes, can I help you? And they're like, you're, that's your camera. I'm like, it is my camera. Did, what can I help? And they're like, oh, what are you doing? And so it's been a really positive response, which has been awesome. Um, these are just some pictures from the field where we're testing heights. Uh, and no, the camera on the top did not get set that high. We were dancing. Uh, so that's Thomas and my students and Maggie on the bottom there. I did ask her permission to use that photo, by the way. So some early results, right? Um, lots of foot traffic. So we've mainly been focusing on the, the cameras on trails because we want to make sure that those cards aren't running out. We're not really sure what to expect in terms of people use. Uh, so we've been turning those over faster. Anvil Trail is a bit busier than Scudic Mountain Overlook, as far as we can tell right now. It's totally anecdotal. That's based on the number of captures. Okay. We get a lot of cute puppers um, <laughs> and lots of feet. I did decide to put this, this one in here on the left, and I did block out the face. And I put that there because they're on at least two of our cameras, if not more. And every single picture, they come in from the side. So they see the camera, and they're like, yo. You know, and so this is one of those I keep telling people when they see us, like, I don't want your face, I want the feet. Like, I need your feet. Okay. So the goal with this is to look at the amount of disturbance per unit time. Um, so there seems to be minimal trail use by non-human mammals, so which is kind of interesting. We have gotten some mammals, right? So we did check a couple grid um cameras, mainly because I, I get so excited I can't take it. Um so we have five species, one of which is not a mammal, but it's still vertebrates and continent. Uh, so we've got white-tailed deer, turkey, red and gray squirrel and snowshoe hare. Um, so we've got a turkey in the, in the top and then that beautiful buck on the bottom. He's actually on a couple cameras. But when setting these, there's all kinds of sign. Okay. So moose, I know where the moose highway is. Um, I did my PhD on large mammals, so I got a special place in my heart for them. And I have yet to see a moose in this state, even though I've lived here six years. And mm -hmm. oh my goodness, if we do not get one on camera, I'm heartbroken <laughs> because there's massive tracks. And like the, I had just finished in that picture saying, this poop is the size of my head, Maggie. Like they're all over the place. So we know where the moose highways are. We know where the uh, coyote highways are based on staff. We've seen otter, we've seen white-tailed deer, snowshoe hare, porcupine sign, and again, turkey. Granted, not a mammal, but I'm counting it. So I'm really excited to see what we're going to find and how it really spreads out across the peninsula. Okay. So here's the part where the data gets really interesting. And the story is super fun in my mind, um, but it's the live tracking of the small mammals. So the other real component to this is how does that landscape ecology and disturbance really shape the small mammal communities? Right. And so, again, I'm just going to focus on scudic here. Um, and we're kind of interested in a couple different things. So low use and different landscape ecologies is really a color code of these boxes. It's kind of um, scudic mountain up through the Buck Cove Mountain Trail. Uh, we have like a high use trail, which is going to be over by Alder. And then like a no use other disturbance. So that's that power line corridor on the left. Um, what we know, I should say what I know based on published studies, and I did not put the Connery study on here because I, to my knowledge, I didn't touch anything. Scudic, I don't think. There was Permiscus mm -hmm. focused as well. Middlehauser and Blanche are the two big mammal surveys that have happened on Sweet Peninsula. Both of them were focused on those white stars. So we know a lot about what's happening near what is now the Alder Trail, which is a mosaic of habitat in wetland areas. And then Middlehauser did have a couple transects that were kind of off the of Scudic Mountain Road. One that looks like it's on top of Scudic Mountain, but when you look at the UTMs, it's definitely not. <laughs> so we're a little curious. Um, so, and then we're done in the 90s, okay? 79 captures was Middlehauser, and that was eight species. 126 captures of glands, and that was 13 species. There were a lot more incidental mammal captures and glands because they did a lot of pitfall trapping, which we're not doing. Okay, so lots of shrews and some other things. 
Um, so this is kind of the basics that we have. So part of it is we have specific questions about use, but we weren't exactly sure what we would find where. So I'm gonna focus on this first site, and this is the site that we just finished up trapping. Um, so we're really interested in that it's a low use trail. As far as we can tell, we do have a camera on it. We wanna make sure we can quantify that. And there's different landscape ecologies. Mainly, you have in this Northern portion here, this is this gray bar, is the 2016, I said ish, um, acquisition. <laughs> so I know it was actually gifted in 2015, right? The newer acquisition, if you will. So it was the area that was logged for red spruce. Okay. Um, it was logged from the 2015 paper at least 30 years prior. Okay, so we're talking mid secessional stage right now. And then the old boundary south of that. <laughs> so what we did is we have six transects um, outlined in blue here, uh, starting at one, two, and three are the most northern transects, and they're in that new acquisition. Um, three, or excuse me, four, five, and six are all in the older boundary. Six actually is right on top of Scoot Mountain. I was just curious. Okay, 25 stations per transect, and that's ish. There's a couple that have less than that um, based on habitat. And so we did two Sherman live traps per station. We varied sizes. Um, we did originally have some have hearts out, and I'll get to why those were removed. And then we, minimum of two trapping events, so three nights per site uh, is what we were aiming for. And so weather is an issue, so we got to out quite a bit. Um, but that was the goal, is to track this at least six days over this period. Okay, so what have we found so far? Um, first off, I'm just gonna say, I will get back to train sex six later. If you notice now, there's only five, okay? I will talk about that one later. That became a special case. But over six nights, we set 1,480 traps, okay? So our trap effort. Um, and we had a total of 124 captures. Um, so that's a capture success of about 8.38%, and we've observed six species, okay? What I want to show you here in this table, I've got species codes. Um, these are going to stay the same throughout the rest of these slides. And so the first one, ERM, is an ermine, <laughs> which is not a target species, but super fun. I'll show you that guy, too. We've only caught one of those. Um, Paro is paramiscus, so those are small um, deer mice species. We have RBV, so that's a redback bull. Um, our sores are our sorexes or our shrews, and TH, those are our red squirrels. Okay. And what you can see here, we have a vast majority of captures are the paramiscus, the redback bulls, and the red squirrels. Okay. Um, out of these captures, we have 52 known individuals. And that means I know this paramiscus is a male, he's 041. I know this redback bull is a female, she is 011. Okay. We do not ear tag shrews. Um, there's no way to individually identify them. We did count individuals that we caught that very first night, like that is a known individual, okay? We did have some mortalities of shrews, everybody does, unfortunately. Um, so those we can also know that they are different than the previous ones we caught based on measurement. But for the most part, that's actually a really conservative number. We do know some of the red squirrels individually because some of them have ear tags but I will get back to the Red Squirrel story because <laughs> they are feisty. Um, that's actually me tagging one there on the left-hand side. Uh, and just for context, these are two different paramiscus species. And what's really fascinating here is paramiscus lecopus and minaculatus are really hard to tell apart in the field. They're actually phenotypically converging. So where they overlap, they start to look the same. Um, so I'm, I know we've caught two species, but we're taking genetic samples. So we're taking tissue samples to do genetics. So I just have them combined right now. But we're seeing a lot of differences in pelage color, which is really fascinating. Um, and that is actually a pregnant, adorable red back bowl all the way on the right. Um, she was so feisty too. So if you look across the transects, what I want you to most notice is where the blue is. We'll start with the blue. Okay, those blue triangles are paramiscus. So a vast majority of our paramiscus captures have actually been in the new acquisition, right? So lines one through three. Um, if you look at the pinks and the purples, a vast majority of those captures have been in, in lines four and five. Right? And those are our red back holes and our red holes. Okay. There's some movement back and forth, um, but this now, we I looked at old boundary versus new acquisition, and you can see the differences. We actually have a higher number of captures in the old boundary versus new acquisition that's predominantly driven by red sport balls. Okay. 
So this was the really fun, exciting capture. This is an ermine um, that, so it's a male. Um, we, you don't mess, I didn't want a dead weasel. I didn't want to mess with a live weasel. Um, I, you, you drug them before you mess with them. That's not what we're doing. So we got them in a bag, we identified them and we let them on their way. They were sweet enough to leave us an ear. So here's the ear that we found in the trap. So we know what individual that was. That was a juvenile female that we had tagged. Um, whether or not this individual pushed its way to a trap, I don't think that was the case. More than likely, either the mouse was running into it or it was eating at the front and it was ambushed. Um, either way, super cool. It's also, we know that these guys are the primary predators of everything that we're catching. So it's always nice to have a confirmation, have a pretty good confirmation. Um, so yeah, there's that guy. But what I wanna show you now is really focus in on the paramiscus and the redback bulls, because again, these guys, they get ear tags, we can individually identify them. Um, and there are some interesting um, relationships here. So 76 of our captures were paramiscus or redback bulls, and there was a 60% capture rate within that. So we recaught 46 of, excuse me, there are 46 recaptures within that. This is also heavily male biased. Right. So we have 13 male paramiscus and six females. We have 10 male redback bulls and two females. We have hit this in the middle of a reproductive bout. bout. These are scrotal males. They are aggressive. There's clear indication of injuries on ears that they're fighting with each other. Um, and they just like the redback bull males too. They're so feisty. Um, but and the females have been pregnant. So we've got a couple juvenile females, but for the most part, they're pregnant. So we were clearly hitting some sort of reproductive bout here. Of the captures, there was 12 individuals that were caught more than three times. This was not at the same trap station, right? One of our redback bulls has moved over 350 meters in a night, okay? Um, not out of the ordinary. It's not something we see at all in Texas. The average for our site is they um, move no more than 50 meters. And since we're catching a low number of females and the males are moving so frequently, I think actually what's going on is the females are the limiting resource here and they're looking for females. The map on the right is still the same with those transects. We just have new captures now in white with the recapture events in blue. This isn't separated by species. This is just kind of showing you where some of those things are happening. Um, and then this map is, I wanted to show you two examples, okay? So um, in the yellow triangles, that's action number 41, that's a paramiscus, where in the light blue, that is a red back bull. And these are just different areas that they were recaught. So um, 41 in the yellow was originally caught up, it was transect one through three, it was those top ones and has, we caught them recently down in transect four, um, whereas number 45 has kind of just been hanging out down there. We have a paramiscus that we've caught seven times. Um, we've only been trapping six nights. So once it was released, it ran into a different trap. Um, he's all over the grid, like all over the place. We also have one that was caught on Scudic Mountain, so that transect six that I don't have up here and has since moved down the mountain. So we're seeing, again, a lot of movement, not a ton of movement. Okay. Okay. So let's revisit transect six. Um, which has slightly become the, 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 I call it Squirrel Island. Okay, I've named it Squirrel Island. Um, so 40% of all red squirrels that we caught were caught on Transect 6, which is the top of Sweet Mountain. <laughs> so it is now, um, you know, in it's that one that there's a blue square around. And I thought I'd put this up because um, we got the same red squirrel that was ear tagging on the left, but on the right is a red squirrel in a small Sherman. That is a two inch door trap. Okay. So we originally had have a heart set out. Squirrels are squirrely, for lack of a better word. They work themselves up really quickly. Okay. Um, we had a high instance of mortality. We caught 16 squirrels in one night. 16 out of 25 of our captures was red squirrels. And some of you in this room may be like, well, that's not surprising, they're everywhere. They caught 10 in the middle Hauser and Gland study combined, 10. And they were only on Big News Island. I did not have squirrels. They were on my radar as a potential, they're gonna get in a have a heart and it's gonna be a problem. They were not on my radar for they're going to be in every single type of trash we have out, which has exactly been the case, right? Small Sherman. <laughs> um, 
So because of that high incidence of mortality, we only open Transfect 6 for that one, well, it's open for two nights effectively, and we shut it down. Like it's, um, this is, I'm not collecting doctor specimens. Um, as much as I want to know where these guys are moving, I would prefer a live scroll on the landscape versus the demo, right? So at this point, what we're doing with red scrolls is we're marking that we have them and we're releasing them. And we're trying to figure out how to move forward and where they fit in this story because they are themselves a small mammal that moves around quite frequently, okay? Um, so, when we're thinking about the red squirrel story, one of the things to think about with red squirrels is we know that they're really territorial and the young disperse looking for new habitats. So we think that that high instance of capture could have been driven, like we might've had a dispersal event, right? They're out moving and then there's just snacks on the landscape, like this is cool, right? As they're going and they typically go out and they search and then they come back to that natal area. So we might've just hit them at that right time. Um, it could also be habitat driven. And this is something that when I sent Vic an incessant amount of emails that day, <laughs> like here are all of the reasons that this could be happening. I was, you know, satisfied this has got to be habitat. Because when you look at Scudic Mountain, it's actually a jackpine woodland. It's flanked on both sides by like a mixed deciduous, lots of red spruce area. So there's some studies that have suggested that at least in areas of Canada, they do really well at jackpine. And that might be, if you look at all of the peninsula, you have kind of islands of jack pine. And so maybe the jack pine habitat influences a, you have these high densities of red squirrels then, right? And so they're, that might be the optimal habitat for the mosquito peninsula, okay? Um, and Vic, you know, he had asked, he's like, is it habitat or is it human disturbance? And I was like, I think it's more habitat. And then <laughs> I got one up by the red squirrels, as they always do. So. Here's some evidence from the field. I actually think it's a mixture of habitat and people. We were doing, well, the students were practicing navigation and I looked over and it's hard to see, but there's the, the red squirrel sitting on top of Scoop Mountain in that picture on the left, it's got a ear tag. And uh, Maggie's bag, she was focused on a map and Maggie's bag was about you know, a meter in front of me. And I watched this red squirrel run up to her bag, rifle and run away run up to her bag and rifle and run away and then run up to the back of Maggie who wasn't paying attention and run away and then run up to me and was like what do you got and run away and then we found the trail mix that had been left on top of Scudic and the squirrels had themselves to it <laughs> so I think there is a whether this is a habitat density issue or this is also a look at the cute squirrel right and they're just learning I mean squirrels get into stuff right they're just learning that there's opportunities for things up there. I'm not necessarily saying it's people feeding them. They might be. Um, I think that's an interaction that needs to be considered. And also, since there was only 10 caught in the 90s, <laughs> there's a lot more than 10 red squirrels, right? <laughs> red squirrels predate birds. Um, and so this is a potential concern, you know, thinking about the ecological communities and changes in them, it, they are a big player in these games that need to be considered moving forward for restoration, for summits, and just kind of figuring out where they are. Okay. So with that, kind of next steps. Um, yeah, I have a question about yeah. the jackpine. Yes. Your trans expo ran across not Sunni Mountain where the jackpine, mm -hmm. but there's other habitat, makes habitat, not very far off, it's down the slopes. Mm -hmm. As far as the north on some of the new property, there's pure stands of jackpine. Did you get a chance to do any trapping sampling in, in those areas? That's a great question. So we, we've only been able to trap the one site so far, but what we haven't been thinking about trapping the further north, there's actually a jackpine, if I can get my little, I'm gonna, sorry guys, virtually, I'm gonna stand up for a minute. So there is actually a jack point stand right here as well that is flanked by the same type of habitat that's on top of Scoot Mountain, mm -hmm. which we're thinking about doing a fault like trapping there to see like, okay, is this still a high density area and you might get some separation. The ones that are further up here, we actually have a camera in some jack point up there yep. that it's not flanked by the same type of red source right. habitat. So we would actually expect something different there. Yeah. Um, but this is on our radar of the next kind of trapping set <laughs> to set a couple transects there 
at the same time as Gudic Mountain, so do them at the same time and see if we're seeing any sort of differences. Mm -hmm. Part of the red squirrel question, why we've left it is because again, we're, they weren't, they were on my radar as a potential catch, but not in the numbers that we're seeing. And is when you work up a red squirrel, it's a totally different ball game than working up a paramiscus. You usually kind of sits there with its legs up and it's like, hey, red squirrels want to eat you. Um, and given the high instance of mortality, it's more of a, we need to focus specifically on that species to make sure that ethically we're doing our job. Um, and so that's part of where I actually touch base with Mr. Wheeler about that of like, how much does he want to know about red squirrels right now? Um, but that's definitely on our radar and something that we've been thinking about for sure. Whether or not they're eating jack pine is another question we have. Um, so are they just there or are they eating it? The papers from Canada suggest that they they do, but we're not actually, we're, there's a lot more red spruce mittens, like, you know, so um, that would be another great thing to look into. Um, and that's actually what we're gonna do next is we're moving sites, right? So our next location, we're gonna be down, um, focusing on the alder site. And so we're really excited about this because there's some habitat overlap. There is a jack pine stand on there, it's much smaller. Um, there's some habitat overlap with some places that we've been at Butt Cove Mountain, but we're also really interested to see, like, are we gonna be catching the same things that Glanes and Middlehauser did? Um, and some of that habitat's drastically changed. So what, what does that look like? Um, and then hopefully the Powerland Trail, which is, that's a picture of it on the left. The issue with this is it's a much wetter habitat, um, so, which also makes it really interesting to us because it's some of the only, you know, if you're going to catch a lemon, you're going to catch there. <laughs> um, you know, like expect a high instance of bulls, um, maybe some jumping mice. Um, and so part of that is also this, that is a different type of disturbance corridor that we would expect it to be a no use area, right? Um, Thinking about the summit live trapping to understand restoration efforts, and then um, we're doing a full camera download to have some sort of information about that. We're taking a brief hiatus, and trapping is actually going to continue through the fall. We're trying to hit some seasonal aspects here to see what the populations are doing. Um, and so, with that, I just want to say thank you to to all of my collaborators and the funding agencies, and um, you know, I've got some really awesome people I'm working with. Bick um, and Jesse both being one of them. Um, so Dr. John Anderson, the College of the Atlantic, and then my collaborators at Texas. And I got to give a shout out to my two awesome undergraduates. So Maggie's in the room. Um, Maggie Dennison is a COA student who this is actually part of her senior project. And we have trail names. So that's Maggie Mad Dog Dennison. And then Thomas Bates um, is a student from Trinity. He's on the left and he's eating something. He's part red squirrel. We just it. And that's Thomas Little Cheeks Bates. Um, so with that, I appreciate y'all's time and I am happy to take any questions. This is from one of our cameras here. Yes. So. <laughs> so yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm hoping to see a moose like this. <laughs> I'm so disappointed if we do not see a moose on the camera. <laughs> but I've also been told by multiple people on the trail that they've seen fishers. But like recently, I'm like, okay. <clears throat> Where are you on my camera? Like, so. You didn't capture any wildcat either, did you? Not yet, but most of the green ones we haven't downloaded. Because part of it, as much as I want to go look immediately, we're trying to not result in unintentional disturbance. Um, we've seen porcupine out and about. Um, this one, this particular camera actually caught four of the five species that we've seen. There's a, it's a pretty active little location. Um, and it's it's near, it's kind of inland. So. so do you have plans to see whether the, there's an influence of dogs on you know, how far and why do you find um, some of these small mammals and other mammals? That's a really great question. Um, if you're talking from a large mammal aspect, I think it'll be really interesting to see amount of traffic and then amount of people with dogs and then where you're seeing the large mammals. Um, I don't, the cameras are not to get people in trouble, but there's a lot of people who let their dogs off leash. A lot. That was my question too. Those dogs are seeing how many are on leash. A lot. Um, I mean, we've actually watched people walk with their dogs to the animal trail on a leash and then just let them go. And they might yeah. ask, like, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm really interested. 
I'm envisioning in my brain a heat map of people and where the animals are. And then also the dog aspect, I think is a really important part of that. From the small mammal side, it's the off-leash dogs that really make, give me pause. Because um, one of the things that we're also finding from our tracking data is most of these guys are more diurnal. Like in Texas, they're completely nocturnal. Um, they're mostly diurnal. Most of our captures, it seems like they're going in those, like we're there at daybreak. They're going in like pretty quickly, like that food's still there. They're not stressed. They're kind of hanging out. One just was eating food in the bag the other day. She was like, I'm good. Thank you. Um, so there's a different activity pattern. And if you've got, you know, the predator in the form of a dog, a domestic dog, I wouldn't expect them to cause any sort of community level or population level problem. Um, you can get isolated issues. More so where they pee is going to influence other predators like mustelids. Mm -hmm. That's going to be an issue. So where, if there's like a big marking area, that's going to be more of an issue. So I think there have been studies that demonstrated that you know, where there are trails with lots of dogs, the, the birds are pushed farther yep. away from that corridor, maybe, and would be, you might find that some other critters are pushed farther away yep. as well. No, that's a really great point. <laughs> um, and part of was starting kind of with the baseline information is to be able to target in on that and say like, okay, what are we seeing? Mm -hmm. And then do we need to focus and say, let's let's do a target area here because there's a lot of dogs or because we saw a fisher, like we're inter you know, we're not seeing certain things. Um, but that's a really great point. And so the, you're going to use the same methods in on uh, NDI in Great Meadow and also on a number of summits? Um, so yes and no. So the camera issue on MDI is a more of a logistical concern, as one might expect. <laughs> so that one we haven't quite hammered out yet. Um, the summits are more interesting right now. And so with the summit, though, in terms of I wouldn't actually use a transect method, I would use a grid. Um, and part of that would be because you could use transects on summits. It would make more sense to do the current plans to do transects down the, the southern ridges. But if we're just interested in a summit, if you do a grid, then you can also get an indication of true movement that you can quantify much more easily. And if they're doing, if with restoration efforts, that also gives you an ability to say, okay, if there's a volume of soil going out at set times of the year across X number, and then if you have a certain volume of plants there, you have X number of individuals that are either coming up from edge habitats or they're living there spreading out and how that might influence the landscape. So a grid pattern would actually be more. Vic, does anybody track small mammals in some areas and ridges at all? No, that was, and when, when you and I first started talking about this, you know, the thing that came up was you know, we we actually do have data from outer islands, right? Right, right. But not summits. Not summits. Huh? Mm -hmm. Crazy, right? Well, so, I, you know, and I was just yeah. here on Mount Cadillac Mountain once, and that was in November when we put this there. Yeah. Um, so, what's going on with yeah. little critters? Because there's not a lot of cover. There's not a lot of cover, but things, you know, it's a very, um, unique patchy type of habitat too. Yeah. Because in some right. places there is a lot of cover if you're yeah. only two centimeters yeah. tall, yeah. right? right? Yeah. And that's what we talk about and, and even talking about like winter work, right? And so what's happening in the small mammals in the winter too. Yeah. Um, because the summits, they get completely hammered weather-wise, but if you get a good snow crust, probably you're all right down there. Yeah. So it's a really dynamic, interesting type of space i think that a lot of the work that's been done with small mammals in the past that we know of um hasn't really even started to touch on that yeah that's where we're hoping to go but we it's a bit of a logistical challenge as one could imagine <laughs> so we wanted to start with scooting to kind of get some bearings under ourselves yeah. and be like okay what's going to work what's not here's what we should expect um but that's where we want to go for sure it's going to be interesting. Whatever it is, it's going to be interesting. Do you expect to be, there to be so many red squirrels? Why are there so many more red squirrels now? I, I mean, part of it might be people, right? So where they were only finding them on big moose, that was 
Are, do we have that many more people now than we did in the 90s there? I guess a little bit. Well, so. Well, from the 90s, I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah so the the, that, it was mainly around where um, the Naval Station was. Oh, right. It's right. The and then now it's we've gotten more use of well, places. Well, the habit have changed about in 25 years. That's the other yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. That may be. Well, so that's where the, the landscape with the acquisition gets really interesting because so red squirrels apparently like like the, the mid-successional red spruce. And we also know though that that particular acquisition, they were looking for red spruce items, but if we don't you know what where they took out what, right? Um so we would actually expect I expected more red squirrels in the new acquisition versus the old. Like it's kind of that prime habitat form. Not what we're saying. <laughs> so again, I don't know if it's that here's this island and this is that kind of the optimal habitat and they're dispersing out, or if it's a the optimal habitat with people. And, you know, um, it's definitely something to consider though, because um, there there can a component of this that um, they can de they will change the ecological community for sure. Um, they will have a strong presence in one way or the other, for sure. Um, they can also change the vegetative community. <laughs> Catherine? No. Uh, the other thing, oh. Okay. Hi. Um, my question is, are you, do you have any cameras near major roads and are you studying the effect of major roads and cars on small mammals? Such a good question. And we went back and forth with putting cameras on roads because porcupines and canids and things, I know use roads. And we also, we've seen lots of dead squirrels. If you're going to see something running across the road that's not a squirrel, more than likely it's a bull. The problem with that is I didn't want to get people's license plates. Mm. I also didn't want to fill up a camera with nothing but cars. Right. Um, so it is a so it's a balance of privacy in my mind, but also, I mean, we're not keeping any of this data. It's getting analyzed and deleted. Um, but it's a, that I feel like that was more of a we needed to have more conversations from um the higher up level of what we should be doing. Um, I think that is an important component to it, depending on what we see, um, for sure. We do have some that are actually right off the parkland road, but they're facing rock faces. So they're not facing the road. We actually turn them to make sure that they're not in that direction. That's really your question. Are you gonna say something? Sorry. Oh, no, I was just thinking more about the red squirrels oh. and, and what's changed. I mean, I think that there's potentially some changes in reproductive behavior, too, which mm -hmm. is really hard to track because red squirrels are. Well, they're they're a tough one in that way, um, just because they're they're feisty. You know, a lot of these studies, too, are. I mean, three nights. Mm -hmm. Right. And whereas if you want to understand what individual squirrel reproduction and behavior throughout a season, you know, throughout their breeding season is going to be, that's just, it's not something that's been, been tapped. And so that's something we've also talked about is that, I mean, what's changed as far as, and so these are all just potential, you know, but there could have been changes in, um, in litters that they're having. It could, there could be changes in the timing. There could be changes, you know, in, I mean, it could even be, you know, climate change related as far as um, snow cover and differences in spring, you know, temperatures. Like what's going on right now. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. absolutely. So um, there could be a lot of factors, you know, these are sort of one of those, um, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're also one of those more cosmopolitan small mammals, right? And so as far as interactions are concerned, if we have, um, you know, it, it may not take a whole lot of human presence to, displace the predatory pressures. And so, for instance, along these trail corridors, there may be um, predators that are not going into those human areas. And it may not take that much human to, to make that influence. 
That's, and those are just my thoughts. I mean, there's a lot to it. No, I mean, and those are those are all excellent hypotheses. And I think that's part of the reason why, you know, Maggie and I have been talking a lot about timing. And originally it was we're gonna, you know, trap in June and July and then we're trap in August, and it's kind of set. And usually with a lot of these, you want to hit like gestations anywhere from 21 to 40 days, depending on the species. And so you want to kind of do every three weeks. The schedule didn't really work out to allow us to do that at every site, but because of what we found at Buckcroke Mountain and the squirrel in particular, we're now looking at these other jack climbing areas, and then it is a, we need to get back here in three weeks. Like, we want to know, not only because all of those other small mammals, it's scrotal males, right, we're biased, all right, like, we know because of the reproductive period, we have a bias in capture. So in three weeks, I'd really be curious to see, like, okay, are we seeing the same reproductive effort? Are we getting more juveniles? Are we getting more females? Because they're kind of out and about moving. Are we getting the same amount of red squirrels? Red squirrels can have two litters a summer. So did we hit it where we, like, there was a dispersal event and they're kind of, like, hunkering down now? Or what's going on? And I should say of the mortalities, two were juvenile, three were, uh, two were juvenile males, three were females, one was pregnant. And two clearly had pups. She was lactating. They were lactating, right? So these pieces of information, you know, it's made us like rethink how we're going to do things. And then also the timing to make sure that we're understanding this. And it's not just six nights worth of data. We can actually start to get some seasonal patterns down to really understand like the heart of what's going on, or at least kind of scratch the surface. <laughs> so, but yeah. Is there any concern for, I feel like it might not be as much an issue on Spirit, but once you move to MDI about like people and the amount of traffic and like them interfering with cameras and traps and things? That's why we started on Skudik. Just because, um, you know, I was, I've been pleasantly surprised with how positive the animation with cameras have been. Um, so besides our one photo bomber, people like, oh, it's a camera, and then they pose or um, we get a lot of just like, what is this, right? And they're not sure, but there's been a lot of positive feedback. Um, more with MDI, I'm actually more concerned about people messing with traps. So those are things that we hide and we make sure that we do our best that people know that equipment's out and we're, we're trying to actively research something. Um, and it usually doesn't come from a negative place. It comes from a place of curiosity, but that can cause a negative human wildlife interaction that's not good for the organism. It's not good for the human. Um, but more so, cameras will fill up quicker. So if you're monitoring, you know, uh, traffic on Cadillac North Ridge, for example, you're going to have to be on that camera once a week. That is a different logistical timing issue when you're also trying to do like small mammal trapping or something else, right? We work in a really small team um, and I have more students, but it's also it's like logistics makes everything, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit more difficult with just the timing of those. Um, so we're trying, we're, we're seeing what happens on Scudic and then I think that'll also kind of determine how we approach MDI for sure. <laughs> expectations or hypotheses for the work to come in Great Meadow or on the summits? In terms of the small mammal, Katie? Sure. Or anything. <laughs> okay. Um, so in terms of Great Meadow, I would expect mm -hmm. what is in the woodland habitat to recolonize the areas that have been flooded. Based on this, the fire ants that we found, though, I would actually expect a decreased number of small mammals in kind of the true meadow areas um, just because of fire ant presence. So I think thinking about the topography, the tarn and kind of that southern, southeastern portion and that uh, southwestern portion next to the Strathedon path, I think those are going to be kind of the areas where you're going to have a higher instance of small mammals. You're going to have some moving in from that western portion, but that is all fire ant. Um, that's really great habitat that is just, we got you. Um, from the summit restorations, what I, I would love to get in and get some pre-data actually because the thing with a lot of this is before you do any sort of restoration right like if you hit it in the middle or you hit it at the end it's like well is it because of the restoration is it because of it was there already like what's the reason behind it so getting some sort of a priori data 
Um, and I actually, based on what we found, we caught three paramiscus on top of sweet fountain. It just wasn't small mammals or uh, red squirrels, right? We caught three paramiscus. We must have been catching shrews in places I would never expect to catch shrew. Like, hands down, what are you doing here, dude? Um, I love them. I'm totally team shrew all the way. <laughs> uh, shrew study, sign me epic. <laughs> um, but... So I would actually, from what we've seen, especially in bouldery habitats, there's enough crevices and enough places to hide. And I would be really curious and wouldn't be surprised. So I guess this is more, not quite a hypothesis, but conjecture. Peaks that have good ridge lines, um, I would expect to see some edge effects. And I would expect that with restoration, you can actually draw things in. But I think it depends on the timing of the restoration. How much you do and if it becomes like this is a steady source of food right like you're restoring every month or like every year at the same time and you happen to hit the reproductive excuse me the reproductive period that's going to be very different than if like you're offset from it um but i actually think we have well y'all have more biodiversity on peaks than we would expect so right following up on like, the summit thing a yeah bit. A lot of summits have been picked clean of rocks, which have been thrown into the summit here. So, there, as I said, there's not a whole lot of cover. I've often mm -hmm. wondered, well, what's the insect or invertebrate oh, yeah. populations going on there? And is it is it going to be enough to feed? Is, I assume that's what yeah. these things are going to be eating. Nice uh, uh, are going to be eating. Is there enough going to be enough food there for them to survive? Or, uh, I mean, <clears throat> if it's not there year round, it, again, I think it depends on that edge effect. These guys are moving tremendous well, distances, yeah. tremendous distances. Um, I think I've talked about this. I don't buy any of the home range stuff with small mammals because it depends on microhabitat, and there's no way that you can extrapolate that out. Like published literature, it's anywhere from 250 square meters to 8,000 square meters. Um, plus, they don't live very long, and you've got these population, you know, booms and busts. And microhabitat work actually on NDI from Glancy's PhD shows that there's no real relationship between microhabitat and what species you're seeing. Like it, it varied by year. So these microhabitat and climactic factors seem to be the thing that really matters. So even if you don't see some residents on a summit, I guarantee you, you're going to have individuals who are curious and they're moving and they're trying to find these. And then if it becomes a like, this is a great stopover, that's going to change over the course of time. Um, which could be really interesting, but I think it from a summit restoration standpoint and like a longevity standpoint, thinking about what organisms are there and then also how they interact with the restoration to make sure that it succeeds and they don't necessarily eat everything <laughs> is important. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to find some Miridae species on top of Cadillac because there's a leech field. If you're going to find a house mouse, it's going to be on top of Cadillac in a building. And if this is being reported, I probably should have said that. But how did you get there? How do house mice get anywhere? <laughs> right? Like that's I Maggie and I were talking about that. It's this, they don't disperse very far. And I'm like, well, there's a house in the middle of the woods, and they're an introduced species, and you don't catch them in anything but in the house. They clearly got there somehow, right? But I would so if you're gonna talk like house mice or I hate to say the words radish radish so rats right you're gonna see those more towards scudic woods like these buildings and those are things that if they stay there cool right they're not really moving but it would also be nice to know that you've got them there and you're dealing with them you know so one o'clock it's one o'clock folks. Thank you so oh, much. Great. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Wow. Such a great to be continued. Right. Stay tuned. What are they going to find next? Well, so this was something that <laughs> I just, I'm honestly blown away. Like we've, we have caught our site for over two years in Texas and we have a, like maybe a hundred. Yeah. Like this is not, we, I did not expect this. Whatsoever. Did 